أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا بالقاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين So tonight is the uh, the seventh night, the seventh night of, of Muharram, and we're up to the seventh number within the book, or the seventh chapter within the book. And as the numbers are going higher, it's becoming much harder to, to speak within a confined 20-minute period or so. So with this hadith, it's, it's going to be a little bit simpler. Um, and and the, the title of this hadith that a Sheikh al-Saduq gave was the seven levels or the seven degrees of Islam. And it begins with one of, in, in fact, this, this particular hadith is found both in Al-Khisal and Kitab Al-Kafi. Okay? They're slightly different. Both of them are, are, are very similar hadith, but slightly different. So I'm kind of, to get a better picture of what the actual story, I'm merging them together. If it's necessary, I'll say that this one's in this book and this one's in this book. So the story begins with one of the servants of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. One of the servants of Imam al-Sadiq, of course the Imams had servants. One of the ways of spreading Islam was that they would purchase servants from other people, usually unjust people. They would train them up and you know, teach them Islam and then free them later on. And this is one of the, the best ways that they spread Islam, especially after Karbala with Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam. So Imam al-Sadiq had one of his servants who did some, some work for him. He did a job for him. He went to another city. He, he did a job for him, and then he came back. He, the, the one narrating it is that servant. And he's saying that it was an extremely tough job for me. It was a long, long, long travels for me. And by the time I got home, I, I just got to my bed, and I just, you know, spread myself out like I was exhausted. And all of a sudden, uh, I hear a knock on my door, and Imam al-Sadiq says, I've come to see you. So I've cri- quickly, you know, put myself together. I don't want to be looking like I'm spreading myself out and disrespectful to the, uh, to, to the Imam. I've, I've gathered, gathered myself, crossed my legs, and I told him to come in. So the Imam came in, and they started talking about this particular job that they did. So the servant was explaining what happened, and it was a successful job, and Imam al-Sadiq said thank you, and praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then they talked about some of the details of this job. One of the things that happened when they were discussing this is a group of people were mentioned. A group of people from within that city. As soon as that was mentioned, the servant of Imam al-Sadiq, he said, oh, I don't like them. I do bara'a from them. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. I do bara'a from them. They're the type of people that don't say the same things that we say. So the imam says, do they love us? Are they muwalun to Ahlul Bayt? He said, yes, they are. So they love, they love us, they're Shia, but they just don't, don't say exactly the same things that you say. In the other narration, in the other book, in, 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 in this one, in fact, in Al-Khisal, in Al-Kafi, this, is, this part isn't mentioned. He goes into more details where he says that they say that Imam Ali salam is the best of companions. He prefer, he's preferred over all of them. And they believe in his fada'il, but they don't put him in the same rank as what we do. Meaning what? I mean, here there's, mashallah, maybe let's say 120 people, 150 people. Each one of us will probably think or imagine or talk about Ahlul Bayt in a, in a different particular way. Some people might talk about Imam Ali so high that it's probably too high, where it reaches the level of Ghulu. Some people will make him so low that he reaches the level that basically he's one of us. But usually... Within the Shia, the Ahlul Bayt, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we put him in a category where there's some discrepancy. For example, some will say that he's so infallible that he never made any mistakes, whether it be religious or non-religious. Some will say, no, he's only infallible when it comes to religion. Some will say, no. Some will say that they were infallible with religion, but sometimes they forgot in certain matters, like prayers. Even, even one of the scholars of the time, Sheikh al himself, he says 
that he believed that at, at times the Prophet might forget in, in Salah. In the, in the fact that you know he might forget if it's second ruk'ah or fourth ruk'ah. But this was a special type of sahu. It was done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach a lesson. What to do when you forget your salah. Others will say, no, this is, this is completely wrong. The, the, prophet, the prophet could never do that. So there is discrepancy between us. Or some will say they have wilayatid taqwini. That the imams can control every single atom on the earth. And they use proofs from the Qur'an and the Ahadith. Some will say, no, this is exaggeration. How can you say that? And then it also happens with fiqh or tariq, you know, uh, uh, jurisprudence or, or history. A simple one when it comes to history is the example over here. The table where on the, is it the seventh night, that they bring candles and flowers representing what? Representing what? The wedding of? Al Qasim. So you'll have, you'll find Shia followers of Ahlul Bayt who will disagree about this as well. Some will say yes, there's nothing wrong with this happened because he wanted to get married and there's no. Some will say no, this is absolutely incorrect. This is not found in any of our books, not in any of our narrations. Now the question is, brothers and sisters, how did Imam Al Sadiq alayhi salam respond to his servant when he said this? He said, do, you, do they love us? He said yes. And you do bara'ah from them? He said, yes. Is this close enough? Is it good? Is it good? At the back, okay? Okay, sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. No, no, it's fine. So you do bara'ah from them? He said, yes. He said, let me ask you a question. Me, as an imam, as an imam, I know some things... And I do some things that you don't do or that you don't know. Should I do bara'a from you? The servant says, may I be your ransom? May I be sacrificed for you? Please don't do bara'a from me. Because if an imam does bara'a from someone, I need, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There's no hope for you. Then he says, the prophet had some things or knew some things or did some things that we didn't have or do or say. Should he do bara'a from us? He says, oh, of course not. And then he goes, Allah knew and said or did some things that the Prophet didn't. Should Allah do bara'a from him and from us? And khalas, we just lose hope in everything and all of us are going to hell. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. He said, no. He said, you know some things that other people don't know. You do bara'a from them. Therefore, with this principle... All of us are going to be damning ourselves. How many Muslims are here? Let's just keep it within this room. There is, let's say, 150 people. Each one will do it, be doing bara'a from the other person. Because there's no single person in this room that has exactly the same aqidah as the other person. There'll be slight differences. Why? Because there's differences in knowledge, differences in understanding, differences in capacity. So the servant says, so what do we do? Teach me. If we're not doing meant to do bara'a, what are we supposed to do? The imam says, love them. Befriend them, be friends with them, and help them. They are our brothers and sisters in Tashayya, brothers and sisters in Islam. And help one another to increase your, your level. He says there are how many levels or degrees in Islam? Seven. Seven. He says the, first, the lowest level, in, in Al-Khisal he names them, but for the sake of brevity I'm not going to name those levels. In Al-Kafi he doesn't name them. He says there are seven levels. Some Shia have only one level. This is the lowest level of it. Of course some will have none. They're usually the Munafiqeen. Some will have one level of Islam, let's call it. Some will have two. Some will have three up until seven. We'll, we'll put the Imams and the Prophet in, in seven. And, and others, you know, probably will try and be maybe, inshallah, will be number three, four, five, maybe six. So he said, there's these seven levels. Now, based on your principle, number two should do bara'a from number one. Number three should do bara'a. Bara'a means disassociation. Yani, cut ties and say, we have nothing to do with you, you have nothing to do with us. Three should do it to two. Four should do it to three. Five should do it to four. Six, seven should do it to six. He says, this is not the way it's supposed to be. And sometimes it works the other way around. This isn't part of the narration, but sometimes it works in the other way around. Number one will do bara'a from number two. Why? Because it cannot comprehend the level of number two, so it thinks level number two is wrong. But rather, we should be helping one another. Number two, the person in level number two, 
his level of iman, his Islam, his knowledge should be helping, number one, pulling them up. He goes on to say that the way that you should do this is with gentleness, with love, with compassion. Don't be harsh. Remember the lecture in night three with Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahyan and Anil Munkar in joining good and forbidding evil. Did we say you have to be harsh and be like policemen and grab a, a miswak and start slapping them left and right and say, Yallah, what are you doing? Pray. But, or is it with gentleness, kindness? Consider their situation. The Imam says, do it, do it patiently. And then he gives an example. He gives an example. He says, let me, let me explain how, a, a little story to you. Once upon a time, there was a Muslim, and his next door neighbor was a Christian. And this Muslim worked so hard to make this person a Muslim. Every day, it says he would beautify, he would adorn Islam, he would make it look so beautiful and attractive, and he would never stop. He would never stop. He would keep on doing it and doing it and doing it every day. Every day. You should become Muslim. Look at this is the, 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 the religion of peace and, and all this sort of stuff. Mercy. Bismillah ar-Rahman. All of these things he used against him to say that the Islam is the religion of truth. Haq. You should become a Muslim. Eventually, eventually, that, that Christian said, okay, fine. I'll become a Muslim. You've convinced me. He said, alhamdulillah. So what happened the next morning, next morning, let's say three o'clock, he knocks, three in the morning, he knocks on the door of that Christian. Knocks, knocks, no answer. The Christian, Khatiyah, the ex-Christian, let's say, he was sleeping. He keeps on knocking until he says, who is it? He says, it's Fulan, your neighbor. He said, what do you want? He says, you're a Muslim now. Put on your clothes. Grab your prayer mat and turba that I gave you in your new revert kit that I gave you. And let us go to the masjid to pray. So Khatiyah, he's put on his clothes, grabbed his prayer mat and, 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 and whatnot. And he's gone with him to the masjid. So they got there. And so he's like, what's the first prayer? He says, it's Fajr. So he's like, okay, so let's do it. He's like, no, no, no it's not Fajr time yet. First, we have to do Salat al-Layl. Let's read some Quran. Let's do Tasbih. And then we'll do Salat al-Fajr. Okay, so they did it, they did all that, they read the Surah to Ikhlas, he was teaching him how to pray and whatnot, until Fajr. They did Fajr prayer. So after Fajr prayer, he, he ro starts rolling up his prayer mats, the, the Muslim says, what are you doing? The Christian says, we prayed Fajr, it's home time now. He says, no, no, no. Not, not long now, a few you know, prayers and, and a bit more I'll teach you about the Quran, and then what is it next? Dhuhr prayers. Let's just stay for that. He says, okay, no problem. So he does it. Until, you know, like Quran, dhikr, gaining knowledge, until Luhur time. They pray Luhur. And what happens after that? It's only one hour or so. It's mustahab to do nafila prayers in between. And then it's the, the preferred time for Asr. Let's pray Asr. Okay, no problem. They pray Asr. Look, it's winter time. So in winter time, the days are short. After Asr prayers lost, what do we do? Maghrib. Okay, no problem. The sun sets. They pray Maghrib. What's next? Ahsantum, Aisha. They pray Aisha prayers. And then, you know, the guy's exhausted. He's about to collapse. He says, that then he let him go home. So they went home. Alhamdulillah, the guy's exhausted. He's gone home, gone straight to bed. Next morning. Three o'clock in the morning, he knocks on the door. Who is it? It's Fulan. What do you want? Yalla, you did, you did well the first day. Let's go second day. You're on a roll. He says, take your religion. Take your prayers. Take everything that you have told me. It's too hard for me. I don't want it. Get out of here. The imam says, just the way, the same way that he brought him into Islam, with persistence, he took him. Out of Islam. He took him out of Islam. In Al Kafi, that's where the narration stops. In Al Khisal, it goes a bit further. He says, So when you are teaching people, when you are trying to uh, you know, uh, increase them in their Iman, their Islam, their knowledge, you might be at a level where you pray all day and all night. 
But consider their situation. Be soft with them. In fact, there's a few lessons in this story. Number one, the first lesson is what? The first lesson is you might be at a particular level, but somebody else might not be at that level. And what do we do? We try and, and pull them with us. But they might not be ready to reach that stage. And when we pull them to that stage, what happens? They run away completely. Even Imam Ali السلام, he has a narration where he says, if you're getting sick of the mustahabbat, if it's making you hate worship, leave it. Don't do the mustahabbat. Just focus on the, the wajib prayers. As long as you don't get sick of it, sick of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you get sick of it through the mustahabbat, you'll get sick of the wajibat as well. So not everyone is at the same level. And sometimes, you know, we're coming to these ten nights. We might see somebody come only one night. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. We might see somebody come one night or two nights or three nights. And what do we do? We start judging them. We start judging them. They might have work. They might be doing their best. But what do we do? We start judging them. We say, you know, you should, you should feel guilty, man. This is for Imam al Hussein. What are you doing? Until to the point they're like, I don't even want to come to any anymore. Every time I come, instead of feeling the, 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 the grief and the love for Imam al Hussein, I'm just getting abused the whole time. But the other lesson behind it, is the person's condition, that, that person that just became a Muslim, his worship might be better than that person's. How? You know, worship of Allah is not limited to praying and fasting and hajj. Sometimes worship is taking care of your family. The actual the hadith in Al-Kafi says, instead of him saying, you know, take your religion, it's too hard for me. What did he say? He said, take your religion... I have to work, I have to feed my family. Khatiya, the guy, instead of allowing him to serve his family, you've completely taken him away. And, and we, there's, a, there's many sayings where the Sufis, what did they used to do? They used to disassociate from the dunya and just sit in a room and just do dhikr and, and pray and whatnot. The Imam says, this is not Islam, neglecting your family, neglecting your brothers and sisters in faith. So there's multiple lessons. In Al-Khisal, it continues. And this is the important part. This is the crux of the, inshallah, five minutes left. This is the crux, five minutes left. Yeah? This is the crux of, the, of the, the hadith. The Imam says, you should be soft with the people when bringing them up to your level because, because, just like you are forcing your religion and your beliefs and your way upon them, it's the same way Bani Omeyya forced their rule upon people. They forced people with the sword. They forced people with oppression. They forced people with injustice. This is not the way of Ahlul Bayt where you shove things down people's throats. How did the Ahlul Bayt do it? He says, we did not rule with the sword, but we rule the hearts with love and, and persistence and patience and ijtihad and struggle and kindness and good manners and akhlaq. This is the way of Ahlul Bayt. And he ends the hadith with attract people to our religion. We're so busy trying to go out there and converting everyone with our words. But sometimes you just have to act like a Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, and people will come to you. Wallahi, if we all act like the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the whole world will eventually become Muslim. But unfortunately, we let him down a lot of the times. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So the moral, brothers and sisters... Whether you're on a lower level, whether you're on a higher level, treat people with gentleness. Now, nowadays, you know, this was about aqaid. This was about big things like infallibility and whatnot. But now we've reduced ourselves to doing disassociation from people simply because they follow a particular marja. They follow one marja, therefore, I want nothing to do with that person. They go to this center, therefore, I want nothing to do with that person. They help this community... Or sometimes, you know, a Lebanese might help an Iraqi community and they say, you've, you've betrayed the Lebanese community. Remember we talked about Asabiya yesterday. This is what we've reduced ourselves to. But also, and I'll end with this hadith, inshallah. I promise this is, this is the end. Sometimes, you know, we're gentle with people. We believe that we're at a level where we need to drag people up, alhamdulillah. But sometimes we're gentle with people, but they treat us bad. In return, you give them advice and they attack us. And it's hard to remain patient, isn't it? Sometimes we attack them back. 
One of the companions, his name, his name was Yunus bin Abdul Rahman. Yunus bin Abdul Rahman. He was one of the companions of Imam, uh, Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam. Imam al-Kadhim saw that this guy was at a high level, an extremely high level. He was, in fact, his teacher was Hisham bin Hakim. Bin al-Hakim. I mentioned him earlier. These guys were giants when it came to those seven levels. If they were not number, level seven, there were six and five. There were, there were scholars, there were muttaqeen, there were philosophers. Hisham ibn al-Hakim had a book, Al-Red, Ala Aristatlis, I think that's how you say it in Arabic, Fi Tawheed. What is it? Aristotle. Yeah, Aristotalis. Aristotle in English. Aristotle, I think we all know who Aristotle is. Some people say that he was a prophet, although the, 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 the scholars of Rijal say that he had a book, and this is why I do not believe he is a prophet. The, the scholars say that he has a book, he was a companion, he wrote over a hundred books, I believe, something close to that. One of his books was the refutation of the Tawheed of Aristotle. These guys were massive. They, we don't, they don't get happy by reading just one page. They used to write books against people like Aristotle. So his student, Yunus, Bin Abdul Rahman, who was a companion of Imam al-Kadhim, he used to try and guide, guide people and bring them up to his level. He used to know the secrets of the Imam. But what happened was people would reject him. And so he became harsh with them as well. The Imam comes up to him and he says, don't be harsh with the people. Be soft. You're pushing them further away from you. He says, but they call me Zandiq. They call me an apostate for my beliefs. And you know that I know the truth, ya Imam. And they're the ones misguided. They call me apostate. He says, I understand. But if I were to put a pearl in your hand, if I were to put a pearl in your hand, and I were to show all of you, he's saying this to Yunus bin Abdul Rahman, if I were to put a pearl in my hand and show all of you, and all of you said that's not a pearl, that's a rock, will that harm you at all? You'll still have a pearl. If you go to the market and sell it, you'll still get the worth of the pearl. Even if all of you here in this room tell me that it's a rock. And if you had a rock in your hand, and you all told me it was a pearl, what benefit would it be? Would I have something more valuable than a rock? He says, don't let the people change the way you treat them. I am giving you this advice, this pearl of wisdom, this level of knowledge that you have. Don't bring yourself down to their level. Continue cre treating them with, with, with kindness. Inshallah, we can benefit from this. We treat people with kindness. We treat people with gentleness. Try and bring each other up. And if someone's above us and they say something that we do not understand or, or don't believe in at that time, don't call them kafir and zindiq and, and all these words, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ahsan Sayyid, Jazakallah Khaira, Jazak. Great talk, very beneficial, mashallah. We will take a very short break, but just before that, as I mentioned earlier as well, it is going to be quite a busy night, I imagine, since it's a public holiday tomorrow. So when you sit, if everyone could please try to come as close to the curtain as possible, as to allow space for people when they come in, and the same for the sister's side as well. Inshallah, we'll take a short break and we'll continue. Sadu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.